Jose Luis Ricón Fernández de la Puente is an independent researcher who runs the blog Nintel. and tweets at Artirkel. We'll be talking science and industrial policy. Jose, welcome to the podcast. So you take issue with Rob Atkinson, president of ITIF and a guest on China Talk a few weeks ago. What does he get wrong about the extent to which industrial policy has contributed historically to the West's technological and economic preeminence? Uh, well, first we should explain. Uh, what Rob Atkinson is, is saying regarding industrial policy. He wrote this, uh, this, or this white paper that, that talks about the, the way that you should react to Chinese industrial policy. And as part of that, he briefly touches on the, the history of industrial policy in, in the U.S., uh, arguing that actually, well, the U.S. has been doing industrial policy since almost its origins. Uh, people will typically point to, to, to Hamilton as one of the inspirers of, uh, of this. And then from here, you can take it, you can either say that uh, contributed somewhat to the U.S. success, or you can say this was key to the success of the U.S., or you can say, we don't know, or you can say that actually it was detrimental. Actually, it cost more than those policies got the U.S. back. So, so the U.S. has indeed engaged in industrial policy since, since the beginning. In the 1800s, 1700s, you saw all sorts of like tariffs uh, for purposes ranging from just raising revenue to restricting trade so that the U.S. could protect its infant industries in various sectors like uh, shipbuilding or, I think at some point, uh, machine tools. So there is no disagreement that the U.S. did that. But now the question becomes, uh, was this effective for the long-run success in the U.S. in those sectors? And then second, what was the counterfactual? And here's where we are running into the, into the general problem of industrial policy. So this is, uh, I think, the, the latest review of industrial policies uh, in general, the whole literature around IP was by Nathan Lane in 2019. It's called The New Empirics of Industrial Policy. And if there is a theme around this literature is that it's extremely difficult to tease out the extent to which it works. And indeed, Atkinson himself grants that, that it, at some point he says, economics cannot really tell you or cannot really judge industrial policy because it's kind of holistic in some sense. It can touch the entire economy. It can change if advantages of countries and other things. And I think that economics can be used to assess industrial policy, and if, and if it cannot, then it, the case should be that we should, that we should probably be more agnostic about it, actually. But he, I'm not implying that, that just because there is no like randomized trials, we should just discard the whole thing. This will be committing the parachute fallacy, that just because there is no randomized trials of whether or not parachutes work, we should be agnostic about <laughs> parachutes. Parachutes, of course, work. In industrial policy, I think we have seen, I think... My, my beef with, with, with the IP uh, discourse is that it's very one-sided. You have people saying, oh, like, uh, maybe more on the free market side, oh, it never worked, it had never worked, it worked. There are the list papers saying, you, you see, it never worked, it, it didn't work in East Asia, and it, work in the, it didn't work in the West, uh, and it will never work. On your hand, you have, you have the, you know, actually, it's great. Uh, it works for developing countries, for developed countries, uh, in East Asia, in the West, and it's, it's the best thing since a sliced bread. And then you have all these, all these studies that said it worked. Now, there are indeed studies that says that it worked and it didn't work, but it's important to consider the whole thing in the aggregate and then see what these studies actually say. So the latest, this latest literature review I was pointing to by Nathan Lane, let me just quote from the end of his paper. It says, nations have and will continue to shape their industrial destinies. Nevertheless, even with the recent papers reviewing the study, the literature and the cell policy is still thin, dwarfed by the attention these policies receive from policymakers. This review is a proposal to take these interventions more seriously as subjects of, of inquiry. So I'll be very careful with just like being like overly optimistic about IP. And I think if there is one conclusion from the recent empirics of IP is that it's pretty much dependent on which industry, which country, in which period of its development it's, it is applied to. <laughs> what works for the, I, I guess it's kind of like a, like death by nuance in, to some extent, but yeah. ultimately I do think it's true that what worked for East Asia, which uh, for the record, I do think it worked for East Asia. It worked for them. I don't think it worked for the West. And I think that some of it can work for the current US, uh, but even though those things won't be the same things that, that it worked for them, that is that I don't think the US should just go all in on steel or heavy chemical industries that the IP for the future will be very different than what sure. has looked so far. Sure. Before we talk about sort of future policies, let's do a little more historical investigation. One of the books that you've taken issue with is Mariana uh, Mazzucato's Entrepreneurial State, which is a centerpiece of the literature arguing that the U.S. government and U.S. government uh, research money was integral in creating the world we live in today. So what issues do we have with that narrative? And maybe pick one or two examples that are the favorite of that line of thinking and, and problematize them, if you if you will, Jose. There are different ways in which one could read the book. Uh, so, for example, suppose that you believe that innovation is it's just a matter of uh, like a scrappy entrepreneurs uh, in garage and, and that's how we get everything. That's, of course, fake news. And the book is a good corrective or correction to, to that view. And that shows that indeed the uh, governments, and in particular the book centers on the U.S. government, 
has been funding lots of these innovations that we see kind of everywhere. Now, that's the tricky thing. When we say that uh, the government did X or DARPA invented the internet or like uh, DARPA contributed to this or that, what do we mean by that? And that's where things get complicated. One example here is the example of the iPhone. But some people say the state invented the iPhone. Now, there is this chart that uh, has, has a st its title, what makes the iPhone so smart? And we can see things like lithium ion batteries, liquid crystal displays, uh, microprocessors, uh, multitask screens, with and those things feeding into the iPhone. And in those boxes, we can see, for example, for multitask screens, uh, we can see DOD, CIA, NSF, whereas for, let's say, HTTP or H um, HTML, which is basically the, the underpinnings of the modern websites, uh, it says CERN. So from this chart, we may think that, oh, if it says DOE or DOD in multitask screens, it means that there was some kind of program that the that these departments of the US government, uh, they, they consciously designed or fostered the development of multitask uh, screens. Hence, the state not just uh, paid for a bunch of basic research, but in addition to that, it consciously guided the, the development of this technology. Now, I have to remark that what Matsukato is saying is not it's not just that the US government has funded research uh, or basic research, uh, which is the kind of what most economists would say that there is an externalities problem or a public goods problem and the state should intervene to, to fund basic research. It's that the state, ha the state has done more uh, than that. Um, in the multi-touch screens case, for example, if, if one digs into the, into the actual story of what happened there, what actually happened is that there was this guy called Wayne Westerman and John Elias at the University of, University of Delaware. Uh, Wasserman was a PhD student under this uh, Elias guy, and they were studying something else. They were studying neuromorphic systems, uh, whatever those are. And they were indeed being funded by the uh, NSF uh, and the CIA. There was this, this program to fund uh, researchers. Now, this is not uh, unlike uh, the way most basic research is funded. Like, you have agencies, and they give money to researchers uh, to fund things. But to stress here, they were not funding multitask screens. In the history of multitask screens, they stress that they were working on something else, and then in getting to this, their, actual, their actual goal, they were being paid to do they developed on their own at these multi-touch systems uh, to kind of aid them in their research. But it doesn't end there. I and mean, if you can like keep tracing that innovation back to this guy called Bob Boy at Bell Labs, who actually had invented uh, multi-touch screens before them. But you can still keep going. You can also find that uh, this guy called Nimish Meta at uh, UC Toronto in Canada that had developed multi-touch uh, system before even the, the Bell Labs guy, although in this case, it was not a multi-touch screen. You can in general do this with many of these innovations. In, the, in general, you can, you can separate the the extent to which it was basic research, literally um, funded on a more blue sky-ish way or without a lot of intention behind it. Or you can also point to the fact that it happened in various places uh, at once. So one specific program was, wasn't completely required to, to actual development. Another example of this, maybe more clear, is that Maria Matsukata will say that not only did the state fund basic, oh, sorry, the, the state somehow consciously uh, got all of this into existence rather than, than fund the, the underlying ecosystem uh, that, that actually developed all of this, but actually the state funded directly uh, Apple, that Apple has, as, as such, got some uh, quote, state venture capital right at its uh, inception. There is some truth to this, indeed. I mean, if one look at, this, at the history of Apple, one can see that, indeed, in 1978, the naive story was that the state invested a half a million dollars in Apple in 1978 or something like that. Well, if one looks into that, actually, it was not the state. It was the Chicago Investment Bank, bank Corporation that did that. Now, this bank was under a program called SBIC, uh, which is the uh, Small Business Investment Company, which means that the loan they gave to Apple was a kind of secured by the government. So the government was subsidizing them to do that. But again, it was the bank that decided to give the funding to Apple. It was not a conscious decision from any agency. But on top of that, Apple was already very well funded anyway. So already by the point where, where they got that money, they were they already had it wasn't gathered. the tipping point money. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. It, it was like one more one more investor in the in, in Apple. It, it was not what 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 basically either made made or break Apple. Which is kind of a, it's it's kind of like a. I think that that's the general theme with, with the book is that the facts, the raw facts are more broadly correct, but the interpretation that you can draw from them, it's, it seems somewhat stilted towards the point of the book that the book is making. I guess an, another example here is that in, in just to go away from the iPhone for, for a moment, uh, in renewable energy, if you look at uh, one section of the book says, well, all this renewable energy, the state has been funding uh, a lot of it. And then there are some charts that compare private and public funding of renewable energy. And these charts look like the state is doing most of it. So then it's like, oh, that's quite impressive. But what's going on here? Well, the, the book tells a story about national development banks that has been financing the development of, of uh, wind uh, turbine farms and solar energy farms and things like that. But if one looks at the, at the sources of those statements, one finds that actually Marina Matsukato is comparing VC with debt financing. Uh, she's excluding, she's strangely excluding like private uh, regular debt financing and like bonds and stuff. 
and she's comparing public debt financing with private VC funding, which is basically she's, she's comparing two different classes of investment in renewables. And I think this issue is so egregious that the author of the report, Michael Liebreich from, uh, from Bloomberg New Energy, I think BNF, he actually called her out publicly on Twitter. She told, she told Mariana, but you're comparing private finance, mainly equity with public asset finance, mainly debt. She, so mention maybe one more thing from the iPhone. What makes the iPhone the iPhone? When the iPhone launched, I mean, if we still remember, for, for those of us that were around back then, the iPhone marked a before and an after in the, in the smartphone industry. But what made the iPhone so um, interesting is not necessarily the, the touch screen or its square shape. There were already phones with touch screens and multi-touch screens. It was the, the combination of design and, and software that basically made the iPhone. Back then, everyone could use GPS, everyone could use uh, like touch screens, everyone could use uh, LCD screens and so forth. But it was yeah. like Apple's And there were plenty of, of enormous multi-billion dollar companies who could have, you know, could not put all these things together at, at that at that time. Yeah, and, and actually Apple was mocked for, for, the, for the iPhone. I think uh, um, uh, Steve Ballmer from Microsoft said that people will never buy an, an iPhone, a, a phone without a keyboard uh, because, you know, people want to type uh, with their fingers and the actual keys. So, so I think that the allocation of credit to the state and, and Apple has to be put in, in, in that context in that, yes, indeed, there were those basic uh, science investments were there. But the key point for those investments is that they were not purposeful. They were not done with intention of, let's say, to, we want to champion this technology and have, a, have a, like an overarching program to make iPhones or something. And just to, maybe to finish up with one other thing here, just to one issue with LCD screens. So LCD screens, which appear here as NIH, NSF, and DOD in the chart, if one look at LCD screens in the US, the army, they funded a lot of work in this in this space. And, and they actually had, uh, they even funded a consortium. So people will be familiar with uh, with Sematec, which was a, pub, a public-private partnership to foster the, the development of semiconductors in the uh, US. But the US did try to do the exact same thing for LCD screen. Back then, it, the US was facing lots of competition from Japan, and, and they tried to both uh, impose tariffs against Japanese LCD screens, as well as try to, to subsidize US LCD manufacturers. What That didn't really seem to work. So in that case, you could say that either that it failed and it was a waste of resources, or you could say on the other end that actually the US government should have doubled down on LCD screens and funded them even more, which is again, goes back, going, circling back to the issue of assessing uh, industrial policy, that yeah, it's, it's difficult to, uh, to come to agree on, on exactly what's the best way to, to assess it. So let's broaden out a bit. Like we have a lot of complicated, tricky histories of a lot of really important products that may have had their timelines pushed back or forward a little bit by government intervention. Yeah. But these aren't sort of like slam dunk cases. These aren't slam necessarily the slam dunk cases that the proponents of today's industrial policy really um, want to use as points when they're arguing for the, you know, $100 billion push to support semiconductors or what have you. Yeah, absolutely. Given that context, what do you think are the smart justifications for having a more aggressive industrial policy? Yeah, so the I guess here we're going to start with the kind of uh, textbook case for R and D funding. Uh, I guess this is the most, the more tame or the, the more closer to the to the mainstream are, are the mo and the more empirically supported. This is basically just the idea that the private sector will, will not invest sufficiently on, on R and D because it's difficult for a given company to to, to capture the the downstream effects of of that research. Now, uh, this doesn't mean, of course, that, that the, the private sector doesn't do any research. It just means, it just means that it doesn't do enough of, of it. So that's one case. That's a, there's an justification for that. There are, but but one, can, one could go uh, beyond this. Uh, one could say that we could potentially just make one given country, like let's say the, the US, into a semiconductor superpower. Now, the, the usual free trade argument for why countries should not do that is something about the comparative advantage. That different countries have different comparative advantages and uh, they should specialize in what they are good at. But that doesn't quite work in general. That is, if it's, let, let's say, uh, in the original case, it was about wine. I think David Ricardo was talking about, let's say, wine production in Portugal. And, and sure, like, like probably Canada will never be a, like a wine producing superpower. Sure. But you can change what your country is good at by targeted investment. So, so it's a completely different case. As in, uh, if you uh, leave things be, you can uh, end up in a place where you don't want to go. But then at the same time, uh, you could say that the price to, to make your country into, into a super, into a, like, let's, let's say, some kind of superpower, it, it, it's in a way pushing against the, the, the current quote, quote, trends of history, which seem to be pushing towards the Taiwan in this case. So there is some potential cost in there. That is, uh, if you succeed, then you end up with an advanced manufacturing in a capability in your country. If you fail, you just threw a, threw a bunch of money to waste. 
So yeah. well, it's it's really interesting thinking about thinking about Taiwan, Jose, because I don't think you could sit there in 1980 and say the trends of history are leading Taiwan to have the most important semiconductor uh, company in the world. No, yes, yeah, that's completely correct. The meaning is that right now it seems that if the US doesn't do anything, it, it's going to be it's going to be Taiwan. I mean, sure, they could say that that if you are China, maybe we'll go to China because China will actually try hard to, to get it there. Yes, countries can indeed shape the the, the future development of, of of their industries. But the arguments around the extent to which this quote works and and works is a loaded word here is is this good for for the for the welfare of the population in the country? That is, the U.S. for example benefits greatly from just buying chips from TSMC uh, in Taiwan. Now, if TSMC were in the U.S., the U.S. could benefit in various ways. It could benefit from lower prices. It could benefit, for example, in a geopolitical way, which I think is probably the strongest argument for industrial policy. I uh, suppose there were some kind of confrontation between the US and China or some, or even without being a confrontation, some kind of, you know, kind of geopolitical context of, uh, context of, of some kind. China could say, well, you are not doing this and we don't give you rare earths, for example. Just China produces 95% of all the, the world's uh, rare earths, which are used for uh, all sorts of things from electric motors to, uh, to semiconductors. And you could say, then the US would be in, in trouble. Moreover, if the US doesn't have manufacturing capability and it needs to build stuff, let's say in a, this would be in, in, in the worst case scenario, then it's difficult to build up advanced manufacturing capability if you don't have it. So there is a case to, to maintain it, even though it's not, quote, in the short term, economically uh, efficient. So I think that the, the geopolitical dominance is, in, on my view, the strongest and most clear cut case for, for industrial policy. The, the other ones, they can also be made. But I think this one is, uh, is uh, the strongest. And I think it justifies more than other IP cases to some extent. So, for example, the protectionist case for uh, industrial policy, or sorry, the, the mercantilist case will say, well, the U.S. Has a, has a trade deficit. The U.S. is importing more than it's exporting, and we should fix that. Uh, I think that's not necessarily a problem in and of itself. The, tra- the deficit just means that the U.S. is buying more than it sells. And that's sure, in, um, eventually the U.S. may have to, to export to, to pay for that. But the dollar is a, is a reserve currency. Uh, so typically, when you import a lot, your currency depreciates, which then makes your exports more attractive. So the, the deficit fixes itself. Now, the U.S. can keep just buying stuff without, quote, paying for them because the dollar is a reserve currency and there is lots of demand for dollars outside of the U.S. Uh, so that, I think, is not a great argument. Then we also have the argument that if, if, if one goes down that route, one could say one should focus on industries that are export oriented. Famously, the uh, US that well documented for, for East Asia, it was all about fostering a strong, advanced export oriented industries and, and trying to get them those competitive in, in, in the export markets. Sure. Now, I think that for the US, it shouldn't be, be necessarily exports. It should be, of course, advanced industry because getting up to speed. I mean, if you need to set up like a new T-shirt factory in the US because you need garments that you cannot get anymore from Malaysia because of some blockade, sure, you can do that. But if you need semiconductors and for some reason TSMC is not, isn't available to you anymore because of reasons, then you, you cannot just stand up a new fab in, in one year. You need that to be to be there to begin with. Um, but there is one more thing that, that the trade deficit our case for IP wouldn't, wouldn't cover, which is natural resources. If you want to be geopolitically independent or have some power in that regard, you need to be or to have available to you resources to, to kind of just be able to just make things. Like you need oil, you need, well, I mean, maybe not in the far future, but right now you need oil, you need this red earth, you need steel, you need iron. So it's, I think in, in that regard, you can start by having a stockpile of these things. For example, in some way that China is, is going into Africa to secure uh, resources there, the US could pursue a, a similar policy uh, to make sure that the, that the raw materials for that ultimately go into manufacturing are also uh, available there. One more thing here to finish off is that industrial policy in the geopolitical sense should be thought of uh, in a broader context. So back uh, in the 50s, when you had the first strong uh, defense of, of IP by, for example, Raul Prevish in the, in the context of uh, Latin America, uh, they were thinking about, about IP in not in a country base, but in the case they were thinking about the, for, for the whole of Latin America. That is, uh, Latin America as a whole could do IP in that, let's say, different countries could do different things and work together well. Uh, in the US, for example, could say, okay, maybe the US shouldn't care much if production is in Germany. For example, um, um, ASML, one key company that uh, supplies tooling for semiconductor manufacturing, is a Dutch company. Dutch and Europe in general is, is an ally of the US, and which is also geographically not that far from the US. So in that case, it means that maybe the U.S. should necessarily try to get ASML into the U.S., but they should try that. It should make sure that ASML doesn't just disappear from Europe and goes to China. Um, sure, man. It's like I don't want to. I don't want to stop you. I just want you to keep going. Where should we? Where should we go next? So aside from supporting particular industries, there are plenty up in the hill and the executive branch who are interested in spending money to support scientific research. So Jose, 
what is broken about the current way we fund science? Right. So first, as a brief explainer, the U.S. funds science through various channels. The largest entity of funding research in the U.S. is the NIH, the National Institutes of Health, which I think might be 60 or 70 percent or for like all of all science funding, uh, which might be surprising. That is that if you look at like material science or anything else, it's a smaller fraction of, uh, of that. So the, the NSF, for example, it's a, as a whole, it's, it's, it's smaller than the NIH. Now, the, the, the way this funding is allocated, it's to some extent scientist-led, that the scientists will apply for a grant. They will say, oh, I want to research on this thing. The grant will then be reviewed, in the case of the NIH, by a study section, which is a group of uh, peer scientists that work more or less in that field. Scientists will then dis uh, discuss how good this proposal is, and then the proposal will give a score, and then they, uh, each institute will, will fund or not fund, uh, depending on, on, that, on, on what score it got. These grants usually run for four, five, uh, six years or so. Now, the, the system is not, the system works and it's not that it's, it's completely broken and it's, it, it has produced lots of uh, important breakthroughs and it continues to be at the forefront of uh, basic science and research in, on a global scale. Now, that doesn't mean that it cannot be improved. Some of the, the key issues that people have pointed to with the system, which again are difficult to measure because of the, of the intrinsic as in, uh, what does good science mean? <laughs> That's one of the hot questions that uh, people are wondering about. But one issue, for example, is that grants may be too short term. Maybe uh, the term of the grants may be too short. That is, if, if you want to pursue a longer, let's say, 20 year research program uh, with having to worry about interim results. That is, uh, if I tell you uh, I'm working on this super, potential fundamental research that's super high risk that maybe will, will only make sense in 20 years, but in between it will look like it's going nowhere. That's difficult to find under the, the current system. Another issue with the current system is that it's, some people have pointed out that it's, it's perhaps not cost effective in that, in the way it works. So to do all this peer review stuff, it means that one, you need scientists spending lots of time in review, reviewing these grants. And importantly, you need scientists to be applying for grants. The success rate for this grant, so when scientists apply for them, it's maybe it's 11 to 20 percent or so, which means that if, if you want to secure one grant, let's say for for the next block of five years, you need to apply for five or six of them, right? Because so, so that on average you get one if if it's success of each one is uh is not much. Writing each of these grants may take 200 hours or more, which is which is surprisingly high. And if you put together all this time, it means that scientists are, as some have pointed out, spending half of their time applying for grants, which is perhaps not the best use of their time. Now, this doesn't mean that we could double the scientific uh, hours just by not having grants, because, uh, you know, you have postdocs and, and graduate students that are not necessarily spending all the time applying for grants and that actually doing research. But it, it means that we could free up a lot of time if we change the system. The reason we have uh, all this peer review grant system stuff is because we believe that scientists can know what is good science and what is not, and that they can predict what will be successful or not. I mean, this is not fully true. I see now, if you look at the statistics, uh, if you uh, do higher scores in these review panels correlate with uh, more citations, the answer is yes, but the correlation is not extremely strong. It's, it's kind of weak. So yeah, scientists can to some extent tell what's good or not, but not that well. So some people have said, well, if, if effectively we're funding science at random because we cannot know what's going on with uh, what, what's good or not, then maybe we should just fund things at random. We should actually have lotteries. So instead of having peer reviews, uh, doing review and applying for grants, let's abolish this and then give people money at random. And there is some cost-benefit analysis arguments for that in that if the connection between between the research you, you fund and it being useful is not clear, uh, for example, you could say, okay, well, if the connection between the score that a scientist, the peer review panel gives a paper and the citations is not very strong, then what is the connection between the citations and that science being actually useful? That introduces two layers of, of uncertainty. So in the, in the, if you combine those two things, then you get a stronger argument for actually we don't know much about what's going to be successful and that we should then actually fund at random. <clears throat> I'm not endorsing necessarily this as in my, if I had to do one reform for how to change the way uh, we do science, it would not be let's do X, although I have one preferred way, one potential change we could do. But if there is one thing is like the US should do more experimentation in the way it funds research. I think that has been really absent from the way scientific funding works. So for example, if you're an agency funding research, you could say, okay, this year we're going to allocate funding in three different ways. Uh, we're going to split our funding uh, in, in three chunks. And then 20 years later, we're going to measure what works, what did these things actually end up leading to? Um, that I think yeah. is what is what is missing, more experiments. It's hard to, it's hard to though, Jose, because even if you do that, I mean, 
science goes through changes, right? And it's not like the science you were doing in 1980 is exactly the same as the science you were doing in 2000. So I imagine you would learn yeah. something from that, but there is something that's similar with the sort of industrial policy research, right? Is that like, there's so much that goes into all this stuff that it's hard to disaggregate. Yeah, yeah. it is, but the, the idea here would be that you would randomize at the investigator or researcher level. So you would assign people randomly to different funding schemes. And then you would see what happens. And I think that, that like, sure, maybe what's hot now, let's say, is new bat materials for new batteries, uh, whereas in the past it was something else. But as long as if you have, like, 100 batteries researchers, they will all end up in all these three different buckets. So you are randomizing uh, across all the different fields. So you could also potentially see if there are, like, field-specific effects. Uh, let's say that maybe for one field it's easier to see what's going to be successful. Now, as I say, I, I am not just recommending to do this, this uh, randomized thing. But if I were to, like, design my ideal way of, if I were on like this, uh, the head of the NIH or something, I would probably do the following. I would have, first, I would have some peer review to kind of say what is what is obviously not, not good, uh, some minimum level of quality. Then I would say, what is obviously great? Uh, what are the things that uh, that everyone agrees there they will be uh, worth funding and then and then those things get funding funded for sure in the right in the regular way but everything in between everything that's kind of like it's not really sure that gets funded at random that will be like one arm of the funding a second arm would address one of the deficiencies of the that i mentioned before this would say we will fund you for like 20 years or even we would fund you until literally for, for the entire career uh, to, to work on your research so you could have a model where if a researcher has proven itself uh, to be uh, to be very successful, you could just give them permanent like money tenure, so to speak, so they they don't have to apply for grants anymore, and they have like way more resources than than the current system affords them to pursue anything they they want for as long as they want. And, and lastly, uh, I will have a budget to fund things that have recently been called uh, focused research organiza organizations by Adam Marlstone. And the idea here is that there is a kind of scientific valley of death in between basic research and more like applied research or more like commercializable stuff, which is taking things that cannot be funded un under a one grant and that are not necessarily novel in that they are, they just imply scaling things or making things ready for to, uh, to be made commercial. An example would be, I guess, I guess Neuralink. So Neuralink uh, from Elon Musk, what they did is not necessarily revolutionize the way it's done. They took academic grade equipment of various kinds. They took the set of the art and then they taking it into the last uh, to the last mile so that it gets it gets uh, commercialized. One of the things I'm working with at uh, Marvel Stone is precisely in, in this area, trying to see, okay, if you ask a bunch of scientists in, in, in the field of uh, longevity, for example, what is it that the entire field will benefit too much. from? I gotta, I gotta stop you. I gotta stop you. Sorry. Jose, so, you know, all those Senate staffers out there who I know are listening to this, please hit Jose up on Twitter for a, a deeper look into this. Let's go a little more detail into this sort of applied versus basic paradigm, Jose. What's the right way for governments to conceptualize the difference between the two? And how would you start thinking about both how to bridge the gap as well as where you should put your funding into? Um, tying, of course, back to our kind of like industrial policy goals. So what is basic and what is applied has been interestingly a debate raging on, on the bubbles of, of, of the economics of innovation. I don't necessarily think that trying to come up with, with crisp uh, categories for, for this is that useful. I think there is good research and there is not so good research and that should be funded or not. So one way of, one potential way of thinking it is uh, instead of basic and applied, you could think of, uh, of funding tooling for science, things that enable more science to be done versus funding things that that you know exactly what they are going to be used for. For example, you could fund, let's say, a new method to, to do like single cell RNA sequencing or something. What will that be useful for? We don't know, but it will possibly enable others to then use that tool to find a, a new treatment for cancer or something like that, which will be more applied. So that would be uh, one difference in that basic research is upstream of a lot of research, but I wouldn't necessarily try to, to say, okay, we're going to fund 20% of our funding is going to be basic and 50% is going to be uh, applied. I think that should pretty much uh, be depending on, on which field and it should be done in conversation with scientists practicing in that field. It might be that one field doesn't need a lot of blue sky research that we don't know where it's going. To give one concrete example, I think that if we look at physics, physics has been stuck, the fundamental physics, that is the, the foundations of, uh, of physics, have been stuck uh, where they are since uh, at least the 70s. The standard model of, of um, particle physics, uh, um, as well as general relativity, has been basically the defining models within which physics, physicists work, and that has not changed uh, in a long time. 
Now you could argue that, that physics is chipped, uh, or theoretical physics is chipped to fund in that you just need uh, people just thinking about it uh, until they come up with something they can try in an experiment. So physics would definitely benefit from more basic uh, blue sky research, literally finding, uh, let's say, the top 20 uh, obscure physicists that have interesting ideas <laughs> and fund them to do whatever they want. Whereas on the other hand, I think that biology is not as, quote, Kuhnian as physics might be. So Kuhnian in the sense that it doesn't necessarily advance by paradigm shifts and complete shifts or changes in the way that we think about the field. In the case of biology, I wouldn't necessarily invest on just like giving people money to do whatever, but I would say, okay, just, I would just go and ask the scientists if your field not uh, going fast, what is broken here? And that they may say, well, we need uh, this new kind of tooling, we need this kind of this kind of machine, or this thing that this lab invented five years ago. Well, it turns out that we cannot use it because it hasn't been scaled. In the case of, of the COVID vaccines, for example, one of the steps required in making them is creating these uh, small nano nanoparticles. Well, it turns out that there are not really a lot of machines to make them because they are basically just like one-off contraptions made at labs that there are only like, like a handful of them. So in that case, you could say, well, now that we know, we should actually, uh, at the government level, fund a program to scale the production of these uh, machines to, to produce this uh, this key bottleneck in the mRNA vaccine uh, pipeline. So I, I guess like that saying it depends to everything is kind of doesn't make for a good narrative, but I think that that's, that's usually a good heuristic in science, given that how different each field is and that the bottlenecks uh, and issues that each field finds itself dealing with, they are completely different from, from each other. To what extent, Jose, do nations capture the benefits of the research that they fund? As opposed to um, it sort of going into like a global commons that just makes all boats rise. So again, uh, it depends. <laughs> In the very long term, research ends up being accessible to to to, to, to all countries. Effectively, sort of scientific publishing ultimately it's made available to everyone. So the, the basic research that the U.S. Uh, does, it can be used by, let's say, a, a firm in, in China. And the China has been investing a lot in applied research because, well, the U.S. Uh, is funding a lot of this base, more basic stuff. That makes sense for them, given that they are catching up with, with the frontier, but the, the U.S. cannot just afford to say, oh, well, like, you know, you, you're just a piggybacking out of basic research. So <laughs> it will be difficult to kind of uh, stop that process of, of diffusion. Now, that process is not equal. It doesn't work equally for all countries. Uh, you need the know-how and the background uh, in the industry to actually leverage that research. You could, for example, go online and read as many semiconductor papers as you want, but you're not going to be making five nanometer chips in your garage. <laughs> you need that. You need that to have fabs to do so. So there is an, an interaction between having the capability to absorb the research, having scientists and, and, and engineers and industry that can actually take that research in and actually having access to the research. I, I would say that that pretty much it will end up diffusing, but the extent to which ends up being used will depend on, on things from ranging from uh, pre-existing uh, advantages, uh, some industrial policy as well. So for example, if China did, didn't invest heavily in semiconductor, they wouldn't see like, homegrown in industry in there. And they wouldn't be leveraging uh, US research in that field. But if you don't have a good environment to have businesses working on that, and you don't have engineers and scientists and universities to, to, the, to, to, to cover that research, it's difficult to get anything uh, off the ground, even if you can just naively just read the papers and, and like have the knowledge. What do you think of the argument that uh, government funding in certain fields can in fact retard scientific progress? And I'm thinking about the, you know, where is my flying car book and the arguments he makes about nanotechnology. Yes, that's an interesting argument that rarely gets made. And I think it's, it's quite interesting. But it, it sounds uh, quite contrarian. It seems that on the on most uh, naive models of, uh, of economics, uh, more R&D, you, you throw R&D in, into the bucket and then out you get more economic growth. That's how most model works. So models will introduce um, decreasing marginal returns. So more R&D means decreasing, uh, it, it will still increase productivity, but, but at a slower rate. But it is only, I think, a handful of people are thinking about could it be the case that funding more research could actually be detrimental? Now, there are possibly some cases where this might be true. One case, for example, would be it's in the space industry, actually. So you could say, historically, uh, the, the US military has has paid a lot of money to, to US defense contractors to, to build rockets to then carry military payloads into space. Likewise, the, the US government financed the, the space shuttle back then. The, all the cool kids will remember the, the space shuttle. But the thing is that when you have the defense sector involved, you usually end up in a situation where the defense sector doesn't really tend to care much about costs. They, they care about just performance and about getting things done without necessarily those things being cheap, which then leads to rockets being uh, stagnant in an era where, sure, they work, they are robust, they are safe, but they didn't come down in, in costs. Now then SpaceX comes in, uh, sure, again, with, with some help from, from NASA and their, and their commercial partnership program, 
And then they say, okay, we're going to make rockets super cheap, and we're going to make them land and, and all that. Now, this is something that doesn't make sense, in a, or doesn't make as much sense if you if you are a defense contractor. Uh, but you could imagine an, an alternative future in which it, it's hard to imagine that, that the U.S. would not want lots of military satellites. But suppose we didn't have that, then it could be that the industry could have geared itself towards more cost-efficient rockets, more gears that, that could also cater to the civilian uh, world. Another area here would be the Manhattan Project and, and nuclear energy, which may sound uh, surprising. Nuclear energy is a clean, uh, very efficient, and, and a great in general form of energy. We owe nuclear energy to lar- largely the it has its origins on the Manhattan, on the Manhattan program, which was uh, its its original object. The objective was to to build uh, nuclear weapons. Now, um, the fact that it it was funded in that way means two things. One, it was born kind of with its reputation tarnished by the with association with the military. Second, it was rushed into production. We, in a way, as a civilization, we got nuclear energy before, quote, we should, which means that then we got things like, in the case of the USSR, Chernobyl, and in the case of the US, the Three Mile Island. Now, this is, these are to remark. These are isolated incidents. In general, nuclear energy is very safe. But in the public imagination, those things got people very scared of, about it. Now, you could imagine an alternative world in which, let's suppose, there is a decreased funding for nuclear energy from the government or in a, in a more, let's say, laissez-faire way with various labs working on it independently. And at some point, Westinghouse picks up the development of reactors and they go more slowly. It could be that then we wouldn't have had uh, all these disasters and then people would be more optimistic about nuclear energy. So we would have maybe more nuclear energy installed and less coal and, and fossil fuels being used. Uh, of course, we will never know if that's if it, the extent to which this is true because it's past history and we will never have another a uh, case where we re- reinvent nuclear energy. Another case of this might be infusion energy. Mm-hmm. So there are a bunch of uh, scientists that have written editorials to, uh, to Nature that have complained that a lot of most of the funding for fusion has gone to this one project called ITER, which has been building in Europe. And the this project has basically, um, if you wanted to work in fusion as an academic, you kind of, to some extent, have to work in this one paradigm because that's where the money is which has in turn stifled the development of other approaches which may or may not work. But I think having some diversity of fundings is good. And if you are just channeling money in one direction, and if your winner fails, then you are left with nothing. When a technology is new, I think it really pays off to find in, in a more diverse way to instead of just trying to focus funding in in one thing. Yeah, it's interesting because that's sort of like the Chinese industrial policy model, I guess, over the past, you know, 15 or 20 years where you sort of give everyone a ridiculous amount of money and then you have 20 companies that are sort of overfunded and eventually sort of whittle down from there as opposed to, you know, a Soviet model where you just have one champion and if it works or it doesn't, you're sort of stuck with the date date you came to the party with. Oh yeah, and um, uh, interestingly, I want to add one little uh, historical detail. There. During the space race, the, the Soviets followed a more decentralized approach uh, in, in that they had lots of uh, design bureaus, to some extent competing with, with each other to build uh, different kinds of rockets and to propose different kinds of plans uh, to go into space, which I think that, to some extent, that might have been a success of the, of the Soviet space industry, in that, sure, they, they may have lost the, the space race for reasons that I think are due to their manufacturing capabilities were not as advanced as those of the US, so the it was difficult for them to make reliable components. But the, the Soyuz rocket, I think, has been historically a, a relatively reliable and che- importantly cheap way of uh, of sending things into space to an extent that the US has not matched until uh, recently. I think that the, the Soyuz, I guess, shows that that if even if in, in a Soviet context, if you have this diversity of, uh, of people trying different approaches and then you pick at the end the winner, you're probably better off than if you just try, just put all your money into like an, LSA, into a, like an SLS or a space shuttle. <laughs> That's wonderful. We'll do a somewhat rapid fire round now. So, Jose, where is my flying car? <laughs> yeah, so that's a, a difficult question. These flying cars have been around for a while. You can see the videos on YouTube, and, and the, the question is more, why don't we all have flying cars? Why are they just prototypes? And I think the answer here is, is manifold. Uh, one answer is that batteries wait a lot. And it's like, well, what batteries? Why can't we have uh, jets, like, just, like in flying cars? Well, if you want to have jets in flying cars, then, then people are going to be below those jets and they may get literally burnt. <laughs> so um, from a regulatory point of view, from 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 safety, you, the, the regulator would say, okay, no flying cars if you're using jets, but it's fine if you use batteries. But if you have to use batteries, <clears throat> they used to be very, very weighty. Now, if you're using batteries, you're using propellers of some kind. If you're using propellers, uh, unless they're very efficient, they are going to be quite big. If they are big, they are difficult to park. So now you have a, an additional nuisance in that, that, that where do you put your, your, your flying car? You need more space. Lastly, 
Do you need uh, a regulatory framework that tells you, like, do you need a, a full pilot license to fly a flying car? Is the FAA going to allow, like, hundreds of thousands of people flying around without uh, any, any control o- o- over a city? So that's tricky. That regulatory uncertainty, by the way, I think that it's a reason why if you wanted to start a company, you might say, well, if my success depends on a regulator giving us a framework, maybe I will not bother in the first place. Uh, so I think that's having a good regulatory framework that says these are going to be the rules for flying cars, which I think we don't have yet. It will be very, uh, very useful. But there are six, seven or even eight. And there are lots of companies working on the flying car problem. And I don't know if they have done, like publicly said, this is why we have not gone uh, like into mass production yet. And I think it will be very interesting to like take all the like flying car company CEOs and just ask them, dude, where are our mass produced flying cars? I think that maybe we will start to see flying cars, not in that, that you can drive them, but we will see more like a flying uh, taxis. Uh, I think that that's easier in that you can have a licensed pilot flying the quote car. And I think you get most of the advantages from from having flying cars, which is like point to point, very fast transportation. I think it's a combination of various constraints, the technologies involved, the fact that historically some approaches that may work now didn't work in the past, plus also the, the regulatory environment. It's not an, an easy question and it's not a matter of a people of giving up on flying cars. People are still trying to make flying cars. And I think that the fact that there are so many people trying to do so should give us some pause into thinking that it's probably not an easy problem that has like an easy solution that we should probably uh, ask the, those that are working in the frontier uh, that is building those flying cars, why is it that they are taking so long? So is the best thing Americans can do to increase global GDP and competitiveness relative to China to just all convert to Mormonism? <laughs> yeah. Probably... Not, uh, um, <laughs> and, and, and even if they did, it would be extremely difficult. Uh, so people are very excited about religion these days in some regards. People are pr- proposing religion as a potential escape from various social ills. And it is true that, for example, Mormons, indeed, they have lower rates of, for example, of, of uh, alcoholism. So in, in, in the Mormon religion, you cannot, if I recall correct, you cannot drink alcohol. You cannot, I think you cannot even drink Coca-Cola or any stimulants. I don't, I don't think if, if even they can drink tea. <laughs> sugar, sugar, is, uh, sugar is above board. Uh, as long as we have sugar, then I think it, it's okay. <laughs> but that's the, when, I, when I looked into, the, into this question, the, the general question being, what are the effects of religion in general uh, on economic development? And, and what are the effects in particular of Mormonism on, on that? But what I found is that certain kinds of religion, it may actually foster lower crime rates. Uh, they may also help uh, some uh, population in, in dealing with, uh, with drug uh, or alcoholism problems. Uh, and I think they do so to some extent by, by kind of fostering uh, very strong rules against those things. So you could say, in a way, it's like fighting irrationality with more, with a different kind of irrationality so, so that they, they cancel each other. They, but you have the problem that it's difficult to get faith to, to US to stick. That is, suppose that you could actually get it to work and that if everyone in the US converts to Mormonism, I could very well see that, that you would see some kind of social ills and quote, deaths of despair going down and more, more like community ties and things like that and people like, hanging together more often and stuff. But... Getting people to uh, to adopt the faith, I don't see that as really being feasible. People have tried, actually. There, there are some experiments where they literally send missionaries at random to different towns. I think it was in, in Thailand. They get, like to try to get people to... It's, yeah, it's like if you get like, a random in this town to believe in Jesus and this town doesn't, what happens? So this happened. Uh, they did that study. It was a, a very interesting one. And what they found is that in the short term, the group that was, quote, treated with some version of Christianity was faring better in, in just, like, income. Through some mechanism, it managed to raise their incomes. But the thing is that in the longer term, that effect faded out, so, it, so all groups ended up to being more or less the same. And the speculation there is that maybe I can get you to more or less believe in something, but without the community that more or less upheld the, the belief and uh, keeps it alive, the, th- the thing just like disappears and you go back to what you previously were. So it remains to be seen if you can get it to stick. If you like, let's say, missionaries going to, to your town every month or something and paying uh, priests to, to like uh, open like uh, churches there. And I don't know if, if that would work to, to have it stay. But in the case of the U.S., for example, I would find it really, really unlikely if, I, if let's say, the, the if a Gen Z is, kind of, is suddenly going to, to abandon uh, astrology and convert to Christianity instead. Well, I mean, it's really interesting just thinking about the founding of the U.S. in the early days and your towns in, in New England, right? This was completely mainstream thought. 
that religion was absolutely central to the functional operating of a democracy. So to have this sort of line of thinking gone totally out of fashion and now starting to creep in, I think, is, a, is an interesting trend to watch for sure. Oh, yeah. Historically, like, religion has been thought that even beyond that, like, the, the mere idea that we can have a, uh, just a like civilized society where we are not all psychopaths, some people have pinned it on, on religion. And, and in fact, uh, John Locke, who advocated for a freedom of, uh, of religion, he, he still, it's like, atheism was, like, a really bad thing. <laughs> so um, it's like, you, you could, like, as long as you believed in something, Locke was fine with you. It was, it was atheism. Atheism, that was a problem. Now, I think that we, we will, given that most countries, uh, at least in the West, they tend to be following a secular path. The result of the, of the experiment of uh, what happens when you don't have a lot of religion, we, we'll see what happens. Some people argue that we will see that vacuum be, will being filled with things that are, quote, like religion. Some people argue that, you know, like Peloton or like people are getting into astrology now or things like that. That may substitute for like whatever random thing people want to do to, to get together around something. Or maybe we will just see also things be, being abandoned and, and going like full on Dawkins style atheism. Uh, we'll see, I guess, in 20 yeah. years, we'll see what happens. Yeah, I mean, I'm sure there's, maybe we can find this paper, but something in China, right, where you just look at, like, over time is, like, Taoism ascendant versus Confucianism, and there's also, like, a ton of regional variation, right, and you can trace that by which temples are where, and seeing how the different strains of Chinese philosophy and, I guess, religion, sort of, ended up impacting economic growth. Um, yeah. I, there, I there, there has to be a literature on that, whatever. We can, yeah, I think that... There must work work for Japan in that, in, at least in, in Japan right now, depending on how you ask the question, people will be extremely religious or, or not religious at all. So you have this, uh, this Shinto and Buddhism going on oh, yeah. there. But they don't. They seem to take it uh, not not seriously. I think they do the rituals. They have kind of the background thing, but they don't like literally believe like in an afterlife that Buddha will under un, un, un reincarnation. But you still go to your local temple for marriage and for various ceremonies. And so that, that's an interesting case study also as well. Yeah, I think we both read the same book on Shinto. <laughs> if you could go back into any time period and just hang out for a while, where would you want to be and why to best understand how scientific progress happens? Or maybe make the case for a few. Oh, wait, that's, that's, an, uh, that's an interesting one. Um, I think that one would be, um, I guess, like maybe going going from the present and, and then further in, into the past. The, the first stop would be at, at Bell Labs, most likely. I think that there are a bunch of institutions that everyone cites as being uh, key for this year and learning about how funding and how just doing research at, at a high level works. So people say, like, people will mention DARPA and Bell Labs and, like, Park and things like that. I think that definitely being at Bell Labs and being and just a fly on the wall, just, like, taking notes about how it worked from the inside and and how it it, all, it, it led to all the, all the breakthroughs they did, that would be great. Then, then going then further into the past. I can also think that probably being hanging around coffee houses and pubs in the in the UK during the early industrial revolution that will also have been very cool. Just to see exactly how you go from very early clunky steam engines all the way to actual things that really work and are useful and efficient. And how that scene of uh, of innovation works. Yeah, I think um, Anton House has written this, this has written some papers and has some work on the importance of these uh, informal networks of uh, people that kind of just uh, just kind of encourage each, each other to, to innovate, uh, even for the sake of innovation itself, just kind of as, as, an, as a human achievement. Uh, yeah. It's it, funny, yeah. it's funny, Jose, you were talking earlier about your sort of blank checks you want to write for scholars. The Ur tenure, right, was just being a county parishioner in like rural England in 1900. You just got a check <laughs> from the Church of England and you know, had 30 hours a week to mess around in your in your tool shed. And, and, oh, um, yeah, I mean, in, indeed. I mean, like mo most of these early universities were uh, effectively run by the, by, the, by the church or by various uh, religious orders, uh, like Cambridge and Oxford, for example. That's how they began. And then they uh, diversified into non religious stuff. <laughs> Yeah, maybe also also from historical curiosity in uh, going back to the to this to one of these like Soviet design offices. I mean, if I could teach myself Russian somehow, just and just like seeing how one how do you do research within the Soviet system where you are both you can be sent to the Gulag. I mean, actually, some of these famous Soviet researchers were actually sent to the Gulag at one point or another. And how is it to do research in that environment? If you say the wrong thing, and you can just like actually just die. <laughs> and how did you do that? Plus. How do you balance like doing your research and pursuing what you want to do versus uh, doing what this is that the the planning bureau is telling you you have to do this thing and you have to abandon the thing you, you actually want to do in your design office? Another one for research might be like going again back to even to like Renaissance Italy uh, because back then like, we didn't have of course like these funding agencies it was more of a on a more personal patronage uh, kind of way the way that funding what was done and I'd like to see how that worked how people 
of hassle to get their science done and at the same time try to do cool things to find my patrons for the research and document how it worked. Because yeah. um, they didn't have blogs yeah. like you, Jose. <laughs> yeah, they, they, they had to be like building like cool telescopes and, and stuff to see. Yeah, like we have this, this cool telescope now uh, and now you're the, the coolest noble man and, and in, in town. Uh, please keep funding me. <laughs> <laughs> that was great. So, uh, Jose, how old are you? I'm 28. I am just reading your blog. I am so blown away by the sort of level and depth of expertise on the range of things that you've been able to teach yourself up on. I'm curious what your process of learning all these things makes you think about the way higher learning works. The range and breadth and depth that you've been able to bring to a variety of really technical and, and challenging subject areas it is astounding. And I envy and admire uh, your ability to bone up on everything from longevity research to industrial policy. So uh, I guess I'm curious, sort of thinking about how you learn things. So can you talk a little bit about what your process is, say, Jose, if you're deciding, I want to learn about, you know, semiconductors or the history of flying planes, how do you sort of start out and progress tackling these sorts of questions? The, the first step, even before that, one, I have to say that you have to want to do that. I think I remember a, a bunch of times people have, have asked me, Jose, why do you even bother? Like you are, why do you just even care about knowing about all that? And it's like, well, most people don't care. I and mean, then it's fine. Uh, I... In my case, when I find something that I don't understand or, or I find some kind of mystery, I just feel drawn to just learning how, what's the truth behind that. To some extent, I feel that I'm not entitled to my beliefs if I cannot just explain them and explain why those that don't share them are actually wrong. Okay, so how the process works. So first, the, to select what I'm going to be doing next, uh, there are all sorts of things. So for example, I may read a book. For example, I recently read this book, Scientific Freedom by Don Braben, where he talks about uh, the ways in which we are doing it wrong in funding science today. <clears throat> but that, that book was really, uh, in, it, it was the inspiration for a whole series of blog posts uh, that go under the name Fun People, Not Projects, looking at different streams of evidence around different parts of the, of the scientific funding process. Sometimes it's that I just see literally uh, that someone is wrong on the internet, <laughs> so to speak. My series of, of posts on the Soviet Union that, that I wrote years ago, it was motivated by one video that one guy did uh, arguing that the Soviet Union was actually great, that actually they were eating more calories per day person than the US. Their cars were actually great and like, everything was cool and fun. And, and they were citing sources like the CIA and the United Nations. They were not trying to cherry pick obscure Soviet propaganda. Which and it's like, okay, well, what's the truth to this? Why, why is it that they can cite these seemingly Western, uh, independent, impartial authorities and yet argue that the Soviet Union actually uh, worked quite well? So then I, and then I, I set, up, set off to solve uh, that mystery. So I guess, Jose, as a history major who's read a lot of social studies papers, I can conceptualize how you build an understanding of these sorts of things and, you know, reading papers about who wins uh, Nobel Prizes and why and what their funding yeah. patterns were or what have you. But the thing that really blows my mind is a year ago, you didn't know anything about biology and you decided... Yeah. I'm going to learn about biology. And here you are a year later with this 20,000 word, extraordinarily clear summary overview of an entire field, which many people who spent way longer than you trying to wrap their heads around these things haven't produced at the level of granularity and clarity that you have. So in, in diving into the more technical things, what's your strategy there? Yeah, again, as, as a preface to that, so my, my academic background, so what, what I spent time in university studying, I have two master's degrees in aerospace engineering and in, in mechanical engineering. And, and then again, it was in a Spanish university that taught us everything from marketing to thermodynamics, mechanics, and programming. So I began with a broad hard sciences base there. In the particular case of biology, my, my process is, okay, first, what does the map of this territory look like. So in the, in the case of biology first, I realized, well, I don't know, as, as you said, I didn't know anything about biology. I've never been interested in biology for various reasons. And it's, I can say, okay, well, uh, let's, what's the textbook to learn this thing? And it's called, in, this, in that case, it's called the molecular biology of the cells. So I just like got the textbook and read it, just like went through it. Very interesting. I didn't take any notes. I didn't try to summarize the book. I just like skimmed through the whole thing. The reason for that, I think, is that when you are approaching a new field, you don't know what matters. Let's say that you're reading this book and you come across a sentence that says, by inhibiting mTOR, we are now upregulating the process of autophagy, which is also involved the AMPK pathway. You're like, what is mTOR? What is this autophagy thing? What is this mm -hmm. pathway stuff? So there are all sorts of things that you don't know uh, if they're going to be relevant. Maybe that sentence, is, it's, about, it's about a very niche thing you don't really care about much. 
Uh, you don't know. So, so first, I, I recommend just like going, like finding a textbook about the domain and just like skimming through it. I think the fact that you are going to skim the book reduces the cost of getting into the field. Like you don't feel like, oh, I have to take notes and I have to do this. No, it's just, just skimming. You can sit on a sofa, just, just, just go through the book at your own pace. And you can, you can skip things you don't, you don't find interesting. No problem. After that, it comes the part where you say, okay, well, now I want to explain this thing uh, to others. Uh, ultimately, a, a good proof that you, you understood something is, can you explain this thing to other people? For that, I, I go into the literature and, and look at papers. In that case, like, okay, well, where should we begin at? Can we find one paper, one literature review of the entire field that kind of uh, summarizes uh, latest stuff? And I found one such paper called The Hallmarks of Aging. So from that paper, you can then get an, an even better map of what's there. And then you can say, okay, well now with this map, we can find, again, literature reviews of the, the different parts of the map. In a way, you can imagine this as like, you start with a, with a map that's kind of very blurry and like, it's not very clear. And then you, you subsequently get better and better maps by reading all these literature reviews about how all the different areas play together. And then again, at this, at this point, I am not taking notes because I don't know what I'm going to find. And then at, at some point when you have to be spend months reading all these literature reviews, you find yourself at the edge or at the frontiers of knowledge where the literature reviews don't, they don't cover it yet. That's where you begin to read the papers and, and begin to find issues like, is this paper good? <laughs> As in, and then what I try to do for that is to try to hone my intuition by going, looking at old papers that later on didn't kind of work and try to then read them and see if I can learn to see what worked and what doesn't or try to find papers that cite that paper that contradict it or something like that. And also very importantly, I try to just follow on Twitter lots of people working in various kinds of fields, everything from like synthetic biology and aging and various other, various other stuff. And then just like try to follow them and, and see what they say to, to try to get a taste of uh, what they find cool and what the latest developments uh, are. Um, or if, uh, or if they say, oh, like this thing that people believe it was true, now it turns out it's not true. And, and, and I will be the first to know because all Twitter goes, goes very fast. The particular longevity FAQ, the way it was written, when I first started writing it, I, I just began like just typing on a page, but then I realized that it was, uh, I was just like, like going on a paper, summarizing the paper, that's a paragraph, the next paper, summarize the paper, that's, that's a paragraph. That didn't, that didn't work quite well. I think it didn't feel very coherent. So what I did instead was, uh, I, I used Notion. Um, I don't use it like extensively. I use it on a, on a, on a tactical way for certain things. Mm -hmm. And what I did was basically build a small uh, database, basically just yes, finding one paper, put the paper in Notion, copy some key figures and paragraphs from the paper so I can easily search them, put some tags on the paper. So like, let's say this paper is about um, caloric restriction and fasting, or this other paper is about uh, telomeres or whatever. So then I, 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 and that plus the year. So then... Uh, I basically end up exploring papers, putting papers on this thing without re really reading them much, just like putting them in there with some extracts. And at some point I've kind of collected all the relevant papers and uh, that now defining what the relevant papers is tricky because there are thousands of papers out there. And I want to find those that get at the right level of complexity. There are lots of things, there are lots of nuances that are not uh, in, in what I've written because they are very specific and very hard to tell if they are relevant to whoever is going to be reading this, this FAQ. So I, I leave them out. Uh, so I'm targeting that this kind of level of understanding that goes deeper than the very basics, but at the same time, it's not constrained by the super niche things of, of the particular field that's at the bottom. That's I think is the, is the hardest part, finding the right level of, of abstraction. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I asked you this, there is a China relevant angle to this, which is basically that I've, uh, you know, found myself in the position of and see other people in the position of because you're a Westerner who speaks Chinese and sort of knows something about China, very quickly you end up sort of writing on or touching issues that are China plus telecom, China plus semiconductors, China plus industrial policy, China plus biotechnology. Yeah, and yeah. most of the people who have the China part and, you know, know something about the Chinese government or, or speak Mandarin enough at a level to engage with the databases and the Chinese language literature around these sorts of questions are then 
expected to or have the opportunity to talk about technical things for which they almost certainly did not go to graduate school for. So I think everyone, myself included, should listen and xiang xiang Jose Xuexi and understand that there's like a process to this. That A, it's not impossible, but B, that there's a process to it and it really takes work. And you can get to the level of being able to say interesting things at or near the frontier of knowledge, but you have to invest the time to build the foundation in order to really know what you're looking at. Yeah, if all one needs is knowledge about the domain, that's way easier than getting into the mindset that you need to do research. That is like getting to a frontier is way easier than advancing the frontier. If you want to know about how do semiconductors work? What are the hot topics in semiconductors? What are the key bottlenecks in the field? Those things are easier to get to than saying, okay, how do I design achieve myself? So that's more difficult. So Jose, how would you apply this investigation methodology to more focused sort of policy stuff or IR questions? But if I were to write the, the definite research about industrial policy, I would start by yes, looking at what the discourse looks like, look at what key topics and themes people are talking about, what kind of like areas of discussion and, and kind of arguments people are, are contributing, and then trying to understand why they say what, what they say. And then you can go into the actual academic literature and trying to look for, for papers that are behind those things. For example, you could read the Mariana Matsukato's Entrepreneur State. You could read then in a kind of dialectical way, her critics. And if you can find a reply from her, which I think she doesn't have, you could, you could then, that reply. You could then move into what I like to call the analysis, analysis in time and space. That is not just trying to understand national policy now, or national policy uh, from like 300 years ago, but trying to understand how its application has changed over time, plus not, not how it has differed uh, across countries. Then one has to have as a guiding principle, not trying to uh, want something to be true just because you want something to be true. I mean, suppose that you have built a career on advocating for or, or, or advocating against industrial policy. One may feel a bias to say, oh, it, it never works, or oh, it's great, it, it's the best thing since sliced bread. But one has to be careful about your internal values and biases and in when going into one field that has political relevance like this. I think with longevity or semiconductors where you're just trying to do a technical explainer is not as much of an issue. With ER, I will be more careful with, with our own uh, preconceptions about the, the domain. The, the way I would do, write this, uh, this explainer, I would probably strongly separate the historical part of the did it work in East Asia, did it work in the US, did it work here or there, with the looking forward, uh, what does that industry policy for the US uh, would look like, what would be the sectors to, to, to push or not, or to protect or not, and what would be the different arguments to protect or not. Um, I would also have in mind the very important idea that there, there can be many arguments for one conclusion, but it could be that some of those arguments can be wrong and the conclusion can still be right, and conversely it can be that maybe the conclusion is wrong, but some of the arguments can be actually be repurposed toward a similar uh, conclusion. So there can be nuance uh, in, in how one goes into answering these sort of questions. That's how I would go. I would take the take the discourse and take take all the arguments and counter arguments that have been made, go into the academic literature for the actual nuance and to see exactly what the quality of the evidence is. And at the end of the day, also recognize that even if there is no crystal clear gold standard evidence uh, about this, one has to still make a call about what to do uh, ultimately. And this and this can only be done from one kind of theoretical model of how the world uh, works, which one also has to build and infer from uh, historical examples. So, Jose, what does graduate level education give you and not give you when it comes to tools to do this sort of um, analysis that you just laid out with regards to industrial policy or a more scientific question? Yeah, I think uh, to, to a first approximation, I think that Brent Kaplan's model, of the, the value of education is correct in that a lot of education is, is some extent signaling. You are saying someone, I'm a smart person capable of doing hard work for a, a bunch of years uh, and here's my diploma to prove it. Now, I think that being forced to do some kind of work in a university context can be helpful for thinking about, for thinking, um, about this. Weirdly enough, I would say that philosophy can help with here. Even though I have not studied philosophy, I can imagine that someone who is a philosophy major would probably benefit from from that in that they can see more clearly the way argumentation works. I think the, the abstract concept of a, what is a good argument, that really can be applied to basically everything. Uh, so that's definitely one, one area. Another one in which one could benefit is having some general knowledge about orders of magnitude thinking. This is something that we were taught when I was uh, in... Yeah, both at an, at an undergrad and graduate level, just thinking about the, the idea would be that a good engineer knows what the answer looks like before doing any calculations. And this kind of 
engineering common sense can be trained uh, and, and it can be trained by doing lots of work in, in one field. So if you do, for example, uh, calculations about heat transfer across windows, uh, actual physical windows, or phys- uh, heat transfer in, 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 in microchips, and eventually uh, someone gives you a problem and you can probably estimate what the answer is going to be. Now, that thinking can be very helpful when you are trying to think about something, not having to rely on actual calculations and having to actually look up the answer. Your brain just gives you the answer and you can keep going. That can be very, very helpful. But by and large, I think that even without ever setting foot in a university, I think that one can get most of the values one is sufficiently well motivated by starting with some, some background philosophy reading about argumentation and then just moving on into the uh, domain of interest. Plus, of course, keeping around some domain experts that have actually done the research and have actually gone through the relevant education to, to prevent you from just bullshitting others and, and, and avoiding you from thinking that you know more than you actually know. It's really interesting and important, the thing you said, Jose, about the importance of having experts or like guardian intellectual angels to point you in the right direction. Personally, in my kind of growth as someone who tries to think things about China, having Twitter as uh, a place that I can, you know, at people and ask them about their particular subject matter expertise has been extraordinarily helpful. And the interactions that I've had with people on that platform have taught me far more than the sort of straight academic experiences I had back at Peking University and, and in Yenching Academy. Oh yeah, I think that Twitter is great. I think that social media gets a lot of hate. I guess a disclaimer here, I used to be back, uh, um, a Twitter employee, but I've been a, a huge Twitter fan where before that. I think that indeed one can just like get more of a raw, like a bullshit free content from just like you go to the, to like a leading PhD in, in this lab and just, you can ask them as uh, questions and they will just reply to you. Uh, it's great. You don't have to read the whole paper if you just want to know this one thing and you can just go, go ahead and ask. But yeah. And I think that also publishing content and putting it uh, out there and, and then posting it and then making sure experts are at some point or another reading it. It's helpful in that they may sometimes proactively reach out to you and tell you, hey, Jose, this thing is, is actually not like this. Actually, you made this mistake here. And I try to encourage that as well by paying people that find mistakes in, in what I write. So for, I guess uh, Laura Deming, for example, found a bunch of mistakes in, in my initial longevity FAQ and she told me, and then she earned, I think it was like $60, $60 for for the mistakes that, that she found. And I think that that's great. Ultimately, if I'm honest about caring about being correct, I should be willing to quote by uh, degrees of correctness by paying people to to fact check uh, what I'm saying. It's it's funny because we were talking about the Industrial Revolution and earlier. And back in the day, you could just send a letter. I mean, even before the Industrial Revolution, there are all these, all these letters of like random people mailing Isaac Newton a question and him responding because this was sort of the universe of scientists where they would discourse about these things in this world of letters. And on the one hand, it seems a little flippant to call Twitter a... Uh, you know, actually, I don't think it's flippant. I think it's, it's interesting the way in which kind of email and, and Twitter have remade that kind of global universe of scientific exploration, which you particularly see in the context of all these COVID researchers and, and, and whatnot. Yeah, I think that Twitter has made it way easier as an, as an outsider uh, to get into this network of domain experts to the point where, where they kind of like they know who you are, they know your name, they have seen you around on Twitter. And I'm sure that maybe they, they will not just like jam down to, to co-author a paper with you, but they will just like talk to you and, and they will reply to anything you have to say. And, and they will just respect your opinion eventually if you actually put the effort to, to understand the field. Do you have any thoughts on language learning, Jose? Yes. Yeah, so um, so uh, as our listeners may guess, uh, I'm Spanish. And uh, although I don't remember how I learned English, which is kind of strange, I've tried various times to learn Chinese. Uh, actually, I, I learned Chinese uh, and I got to a basic level when I was in high school. And, and over time, I've kind of like been on and off of a Chinese and also German and Japanese at that point. With Japanese, I had the most success when I went to Japan on, on holidays. And I think my overall lessons for language learning, both from practice and also just reading, uh, well, more, more than practice, but by trying and failing, is that one, you need motivation. You need a reason to want to learn the language. Uh, you can Doing the, let's just learn Chinese just because. If that probably doesn't work. You, you have to have uh, some kind of goal to help. Like, I'm going to go to China in six months and I, and I want to order in a, in a restaurant in Chinese. Or I want to move to China, actually, or something. Or I want to, to, to move to Taiwan or Japan or Germany or whatever. So I want to know the language. Or maybe I want to be able to yes, understand this obscure uh, subfield that happens to have very cool work that's written in Chinese. Or I, I guess if, if you are reading, let's say, the like uh, CPC journals of their party staff, then you probably want to know some, uh, some Chinese. Um, that's one motivation. Second one is... I think that the fact that, that children have it easier to, to learn languages is not completely true. I think that it's just that the way we try to do it is wrong and we should do it more in the way that children try to do it, which is through constant exposure to contextualized information. 
for example, we should not try to just learn grammar and then learn words in a given language. We should try to learn sentences. To learn, uh, for example, if you listen uh, to a mock uh, dialogue in a restaurant where you order something in Chinese, uh, you may want to learn the, each sentence on its own. I think that eventually gets you the, the actual meaning of the sentence and of each part of the sentence. And eventually the grammar, you can see how it emerges from uh, learning all that. When Chinese, it's easier because Chinese grammar is not as complex as what you can find in a Romance language. Uh, I would say that definitely space repetition works for language learning. And you probably want to have something like Anki and then Ankify again, sentences, but probably not words. Or for example, the criteria for to know, I think was that Zetao. But I think it's better if, if you, for example, try to remember Wuput Zetao, which I think is I don't know. I think with sentences are more memorable than individual words, and sentences also give you context in which you can actually use that particular word. I think definitely sentence level learning. Massive exposure. If one can afford it, actually being immersed in the in the actual culture is like being surrounded by the language and being forced to speak it and use it. But I, I guess the, the closest to that, if you cannot go to the country, would be to just pay weekly for a tutor through some online platform to actually speak with you in the language of, uh, of interest. But yeah, I would say definitely the top one thing when most people fail is uh, interest, is, is having a good reason to learn the language. Like, like you cannot casually do like 20 minutes of Duolingo every day and, and just because and then hope that you're going to learn the language. You have to actually go deeper than that and, and, and want to tell yourself, why am I doing this? You have to have a good answer to that question. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, so Jose, it, in closing, because you've been doing all this longevity research and as a bit of an Easter egg for whoever's made it into this podcast with us, what should I be doing to live forever? Yes. So, uh, so first of all, I want to congratulate listeners for standing my Spanish accent for so long. So now, now you get all the interesting tips. So first, as a caveat here, as I, as I like to make, the state of, of uh, longevity research in humans is not as, as, as good as the one we can find in, in, let's say, in mice or in worms. But the things that I, I could potentially recommend to others that are likely to work in humans is one is caloric restriction or and or intermittent fasting. That is eating less, so for example, um, skipping dinner or skipping breakfast. That is, that is concentrating your meals uh, in, in less time and, and fasting the rest of the time. In the extreme, you eat once a day and that's it. Like in my own case, I usually don't have dinner. Um, I say usually, I sometimes just do, but I try to just have lunch and breakfast and that's it. Another one I would recommend is the diet that seems to work best for longevity in general seems to be a relatively whole foods based, a plant based diet, perhaps with some Mediterranean uh, uh, tilt. So you, you can include some fish, some chicken. Um, I wouldn't go like full carnivore on, on, on the diet or go like full like butter and steak keto. I think that that may make you feel better in the short term, but you're probably shaving off years of your lifespan if you do that uh, by means of a uh, cardiovascular disease. So yeah, those things, and just like drugs or supplements one can take, that is less clear for humans. The one drug that probably works, and I guess a caveat, uh, not a doctor, it's a medical device and so on and so forth. Drapamycin is one drug that seems to increase lifespan in everything you get drapamycin to. Drapamycin is typically used as an immunosuppressant for organ transplantation, which tells you that you have to be careful about it, otherwise your immune system will collapse if you overdo it. So you have to do it always under medical supervision. Do not try to get like OTC drapamycin from some shady uh, provider. But at least on paper, it would yeah, work to increase lifespan in That's what they told me when I was humans. investing in GME, Jose. <laughs> Yes, so that's definitely the one thing. As I say that there, there are so many MDs that will prescribe rapamycin for longevity, and there is one trial going on right now to, to certificate its safety for human consumption for longevity purposes at, at a lower dose than the one that's used for organ transplant uh, to avoid rejection. I think I, that I will just literally stress focusing on the basic. If, if you're doing exercise and not being obese, eating a reasonable diet uh, and doing maybe some fasting on top of that, I think that you are mostly doing everything right. And everything on top of that is less clear the extent to which in, the, in in one person's particular case, it's going to help. I think that the different people, different things will work for different people. But I think the basics are very robust. And unfortunately, there is no like yet magic pill that will like uh, increase your lifespan by, uh, let's say, 30%. Even with rapamycin, as good as it is, it will probably not get you more than, let's say, 10% lifespan or something like that in humans. But I'm optimistic in general about the field and the direction it's taking. So that maybe in a few decades we will actually have things that you can actually just recommend everyone just to take to live some, let's say, 20, 30 extra years of, of good health. Jose, thanks so much for being a part of China Talk. Thank you for having me. Love. ABC, 
，圈里太多 A C T O R， 你们输出的只有 C O R， 我是 M E T E O R， 开个说唱艺术展在七九八，理由发哥们周润发，我的 flow 很炸，让你头很大，左手哈根达斯，右手芬达，我把冰魔卡当瘦身叉，为何我的肚长肉？因为周围太多 rap 让我不想瘦，发音清楚我不 mumble， 我是 rap god， 哥们不 humble， 你的女朋友是萝莉塔，我的女朋友是阿丽塔，你的 LV 广的火车站批发。四个字形容我唱的 hip hop， 就是汤姆汉克斯、汤姆克鲁斯、马特达姆勒、布朗詹姆斯，小人都在死，但是大佬们都让你是是是啊！最近这些 beef 特别新鲜 ，diss 特别贫贱 ，peace 都是明面，为什么你能看得到？我有鹰眼，我不要你的金链，哥们我要银联。妈，你在屋里放着把屋子里装到的木皮箱。抄袭，我是致敬。我们可能长得像，但是不一样。用 word play 印钞的男人，擅长做 freestyle 的男生 ，KPI 都是超额完成。将我哥们录放倒个干声，感觉生活像做音乐了。有好的 EQ 才能做个 master， 所以别让他们把你压缩，让我把这世界的失真打破。You should know that don't fuck with us, don't fuck with A B C. 我们脾气不太好，抢了输来发的 live house， 他们只能 K U V。Me, Master B on my G, we do that masterpiece. Lee, that's my destiny, best of me. 在这比的我跟 A R C， 钻石这才牌子的技术，钻石和白金这种血拼在别的靠近我们用事的对手，从来不是 T。胡金杰，你们差得远，不只是演出比你大了点。嘴里喊的都是 real hip hop， 不仅不愿喊的还每天躺家里花你爸的钱。没实力的活该吃一辈子屁，对自己不严格就没有办法成为 A C E， 写的每四句就累死你，难怪你配置低，我们的差距像是八 K S D A B C， 可做像 M N M 搭配 J S B， Travis Scott 喊的 A C E， 你是毁灭战士，我是 C S D， 不是流走风也能够控制 P A C B， A C E， 我是你哥哥，自己琢磨一下到底谁是 D， 给你一种指纹，你来 C G， 哎。这句杀得特无毒，每当我嘴臭完刷牙的时候，又杀得特杀手，你不得不服输。我继承了前辈的活力，我感激。没流下眼泪和啜泣不关心。我 twenty four seven like Kobe C 罗，我并不需要活得弱鸡的满意。Real rig and that's a real， 哈、huh, ，rap kid gonna kill， 哈、huh, ，有必要的活我就 kill Bill， 哈、huh, ，remember A B C we ill、huh。这组合叫 A B C， 贝雷帽配个黑皮衣，活力堪比 L A P D， 先比个手势 P A C E， 再猜个反派压着 C B A， 面前这道菜需要 T T V， 撒点盐我们拉个门槛。看的目的是为了过滤圈里那些敌敌畏。T D K 的标签在我每个段落用作品质保证。未曾来过，像 John Rambo 就是必须干活。让外挂列在我们就地散伙。你模仿的是形式，我做说唱是捍卫事实实名制。带着至今的心时至今日，你碰的不是钉子是块试金石。问歌词中肯，那歌是公认。懂行的都双手合十公分，站在黑的眼里又何止痛恨？缺货们都该做个核磁共振，别阿谀奉承用心评价。呃，那些歌让我 Z Z Z， 这行业应该重新定价，需要拉动的不止。是 GDP， 再送你个 LOL， 字里 KO 了多少个 KOL， 靠营销的都在学着吹口哨，哥们正在试料，舌头会揉到。拿子当火盆的哥斯拉，无法控制强迫症何时发？因为我像是科大碰上特斯拉，这区别不止唯独何时差。依旧保持嗅觉灵敏，就事论事，我就是个阴影，收获灵感给你制造瓶颈，想看用 flow 让你秀逗的情景。不是你口中的 OG， 我跟他们不沾边，所以别拿我跟他们相提并论，这能让我吐三天。<笑>